Welcome to another tutorial by the Business of Apps and this tutorial is all about the paid app model and in particular we're going to be going through the pros and cons of that model to help you work out whether it's right for your app business. Now essentially what we're going to be doing in this tutorial is we're going to be introducing you to the paid model and how it works. We're going to talk you through the pros of the model and what benefits you can get from using it and we're going to explain the cons of the model as well and what you need to be wary of if you do decide to go about deploying it for your app. Just to explain quickly who I am, I'm George, I'm the Chief Content Officer at the Business of Apps. I've worked as Head of Editorial Content at MagicSolver.com for two years and I helped them launch about a dozen apps on a global stage. And I also work as event editor for Pocket Game of Biz and run my own mobile focus blog at mobilemavericks.eu. But we're going to be talking about paid and in particular we're going to be looking at the pros and cons and in particular one of the major pros and cons and one of the reasons why it works so well as a model is the fact that everyone understands exactly how it works everyone understands that commercial exchange it's a simple and easy thing to explain how exactly the paid model works and to make sure that consumers know what they're letting themselves into it's also easy to keep track of revenue through it because you know one of the major advantages of the paid model is that pricing is relatively static and steady so usually you can just work out how much money you've made as a result of it and also it supports the product model effectively so if the app you're releasing is a product then you can really go about making sure that you make the best return from it by making it a paid app and so let's just see how each of those points work out now the paid model it's simple to understand and one of the major things like about the paid model compared to the free model is that for both you as a developer and the consumer it's really straightforward, it's really easy to work out how it works out. You basically go into the App Store, so say you're looking for Kiwanuka by CMA Megacore, you find it on the store either in the search listings or in the chart, you decide to buy it and then it goes onto your home screen and then you can use it and then you can keep it forever or you know you can delete it and then re-download it but whatever the thing is, you pay 69p for it or as a consumer and you get it. And it just makes it so much easier for you as a business as well that if you're starting out and you need a really simple way to kind of go about selling what you're, you're serving, then that's a really interesting way to do it. But beyond that, it's also simple to understand from the developer's point of view. So because your price tag is relatively fixed, as previously mentioned, it means that you can pretty quickly and easily work out how much money you need to either make to keep yourself afloat, how much you need to make to make a profit, or just simply just how much you're making at a particular time. So if you're wanting to keep track of your revenue, it's all about making sure you can do that. For example, Hitman Go. That was a game that was released, recently released by Square Enix. And I think it really shows maybe in this example about how easy that paid model is. So for example, on that first day of launch after Hitman Go came out, developer achieved 10,000 installs for their app. And so because it costs 4.99, you can pretty quickly work out the revenue amount for it. So at 4.99, you've got 10,000 installs. So it's pretty simple, $49,900. Apple's cut 30% is worth $14,700. And so you take 70% of that. So in that first, the first slot on that first day, you know you will have made $34,300 or there or thereabouts. And it's one of those things about basically that that's about how easy it is really i mean it's just one of the major advantages of the paid model is that it's a simple investment like people will say it might be a risk because it may put people off from actually going and downloading your app but on the other hand if someone buys it you get the money you don't have to worry about monetizing them afterwards you just make what you want and you charge for it and if people pay for it then you make more money from it and if they don't well you know that's the problem you've got to worry about later but beyond that it also works really well for these product-based apps. And I think this is where you've got to really think about where it will work, work best for you or not. So if you've got a game where the content is limited or the idea is perhaps limited, then that's going to work really well for this. So for example, this is Freeze. I know that its more successful cousin, 2048, has come out recently and showed that a free model could have worked with this game. But for the developers themselves, they decided that what they really wanted to do was release a game that really explored this puzzle idea that they had and see how it worked out and that they were more concerned when they were approaching their development tasks and they were approaching it to make sure that what they were actually providing was a game that was complete, that offered a full service to people and that didn't need regular updates, regular content updates and pushes to, you know, say, get people to go and buy some in-app purchases to continue to progress. They just wanted a very pure puzzle game. And so in this case, like when the game's content is limited, such as when you want this really pure puzzle experience and you don't mind about monetizing just by pay, getting people to pay up, or for example, whether say a narrative and people are going to pay 
say a certain amount and then go through and advance through the story, then that's one way, example of where the pay model can work really well. It can also work very well for these bespoke high quality utilities. So as you can see, I'm a terrible drawer, um, but that's my kind of sci-fi robot that I drew in the app Notability. And essentially it offers a really complete and comprehensive feature set and it offers a really premium experience. And so by doing that, it means that it can actually justify charging up front for it and saying, look, we're not gonna make it free and hope that you pay for extra tools. We're gonna to charge for it. And because it has a very clear purpose and it really fills in that kind of hand note-taking sort of element that you could have maybe within your iPad or your iPhone for someone who needs to take notes on the go, it can justify charging for that. And then lastly, there's just apps that are based on products in the real world. They're a good example of something that can really work well. So for example, this is a screenshot from the official driving theory test, which is basically a product that's available in the UK market, in which you can basically take a variety of practice tests and other things to see how prepared you are for your driving theory test, which is part of the British driving license test. And so you can take practices, you can see uh, how well you've done, you can basically give it a shot. And just, it's one of those things that it's available as a DVD. It's available as a CD. It's the kind of thing that you can get elsewhere. And so what they've decided is that actually with the mobile reality, they can realistically make sure that people are actually just buying this as a separate piece of content in the same way that they may buy a book or a DVD or a CD to study with. And so it's in this context that the paid model works really well when it's flogging a product. But there are problems with the paid model. And I think there's three major problems with the paid model in particular. The first is that revenue potential is really capped. With the fact that the paid market is considerably smaller than the free market, as we've seen previously in our history of app pricing video, it's the case that you're never going to make that much money with a, with a paid app. Of course, you can make good money or decent money for basically the context that you're in, but you're never going to make the mega bucks. You're never going to be the person who's making that next billion dollar app. At the same time, user acquisition and other kind of routes are nearly impossible due to the fact that they rely pretty much mostly upon free apps and the ability of users to click an advert and go and download an app for free for it to succeed. And just more than that, you also have to be really reliant on old school marketing. You know, you've got to deal with the challenges of basically going and marketing your app traditionally. And so instead of being able to hotwire things by coming up with a sensible or a clever user acquisition strategy, you've just got to basically rely a bit more on the old fates of things, such as making sure you get advertising on the web, getting media coverage, and just getting enough traction. So just to explain how that works, you know, revenue generation is low. So Year Walk by Samogo, it's a paid app. It was priced at $3.99. And according to Games Industry Biz in 2013, it made somewhere in the equivalent of $476,000. Now that's not to be sniffed at. The team who make here walks and Mogo, it's a small two to three man team with a couple of contractors. And so with this app, plus their other app that they released that year, Device 6, generating somewhere in the region of $900,000 to $1 million in revenue, it's a perfectly good performance for a small team. But you compare that with Candy Crush Saga by King, you know, with free within app purchases, According to Think Gaming, which is a site that basically estimates how much money these games make every day, particularly these free-to-play games, they estimated that the game is making in the region of about $956,840 per day. So over the course of a single day, King are making what Simogo, a small indie developer using paid games, is making in the course of a year. Now, of course, there's different sizes, there's different things to consider. Candy Crush by King is obviously a publicly traded company, they need to be able to prove that they're making money to keep investors and shareholders happy and to make sure the market doesn't collapse on them or anything like that. But at the same time, it does really show you about how much freemium and free to play can really give you that scope for making an awful lot more money. But beyond that, there's other issues. So your paid apps can't benefit from user acquisition. So here we have some of the handful of hundreds of networks that exist currently within the market. You know, like cross-promotion networks, the game marketing networks, and specific things like this, your app basically needs to be free to advertise well on any of these networks. It doesn't matter which one it is. It's the fact that when users go through and they see the fact that your app is going to cost something, the number of people who bounce, it's going to make it very, very difficult, even with something, say, like a cost per install thing, to actually make sure that you benefit from all of these kind of things. And it's just... It's one of those things that you really can't take advantage of this massively burgeoning user acquisition market to help propel your app to the top. And that means you've got to rely much more traditionally upon traditional PR marketing more than free games are. So there's some pros and cons, of course, to using traditional PR and marketing. You know, of course, it's better for low budgets and you can really keep your costs down if you do it properly and reach out and connect to the right people. 
you know, and if you execute it well and you build up a really strong social profile around yourself as a developer and get that right kind of media coverage, you can really get great coverage and basically create this sustainable long-term coverage by building your brand, PR reputation, etc. And it also ultimately means that it prevents your over-reliance on partners to promote. You can rely on your own strength of basically reputation to go out and promote your games. And it means that in the long run, you can use that you can trade off things such as your brand and your reputation to make sure that you get that best coverage. And I think that's really the advantage of traditional PR and marketing. It's notable how many big companies are looking at brand marketing as a way, even in the free-to-play industry, of furthering their reach. But on the, the con side to it, I mean it does mean of course that you're restricted to lower performing advertising. So for example, there's a number of gaming sites that still offer web advertising for paid games, and that works okay, but all of the problems within the web advertising thing, even just the mobile advertising via paid apps. It's just very, very difficult. Beyond that, you know, your audience size is just likely to be much smaller, even with press outreach. So it doesn't matter if you market yourself in a traditional PR or marketing way. You're always going to have a rather limited audience in comparison to that massive casual audience who will just scan the free charts for an app. You're only ever going to, say, appeal to the 5% who really look at gaming sites or look at technology sites. So you've got to accept that to some extent. And beyond that, you can't guarantee good results, say, with the press. You can't even guarantee a good review. I mean, if your game is not quite as good as you thought it is, then actually a bad press review can actually play a role in sinking it. And ultimately, one of the major issues with traditional PR and marketing is that when you've got a smaller budget as, say, a team who might be considering a paid app, or when you're trying to keep your costs down if you're just a bigger team looking to do paid app, then basically you've got small returns and little scalability. So you're not going to be able to grow it quite so large as, say, those who are basically able to use, say, Facebook user acquisition to drive their audience size. So this just brings us on to the last three points, and it's these important points that you need to consider if you want to succeed with a paid app. So the first thing you need to do is you need to prioritize quality. With users remarkably hesitant to pay even a small amount of money for an app, if you don't have the highest quality of app, the highest quality of reviews, then essentially you're going to be sunk before launch. You know, it's going to be one of those things that you're going to push out, you're going to see those bad reviews in, and that's going to basically hold you. It's not like a free app where you can easily go and repair your reputation and add a patch and get yourself back up there. A paid app, when you launch, it's your time to make money. If you don't get a good launch and don't get it great, then it can go really wrong. Beyond that, you need to be thinking about tight turnarounds and tight budgets. So because the amount of money that you're going to make is going to be capped, so you know, look at Sinogo, they're going to end up making, say, a million dollars over the course of a year. You need to keep a smaller team, you need to keep a smaller amount of resource onto it, and you need to really aim to basically turn it around quickly, turn your projects around faster, and make sure the budgets stay low so you can release multiple high-quality paid products to ensure that your revenue flow keeps stable over the years. And beyond that, you just need to boost your traditional PR and marketing skills. You need to make sure that you're either willing to go and spend on an expert to make sure that you get the coverage that you need, or that you basically go yourself and go and really try hard to get that lift up yourself and teach the skills that you need to go and reach out to these people and market yourself in a more traditional way. Because if you don't, then you're never going to really be able to succeed with that paid app. And ultimately, as a final point of summary, the paid app is not going to be right for many people. In fact, it will probably only be right for a small amount of people. But for a simple way of making money, it's easy to explain and it can really help quickly establish the sort of a relationship between how much it costs you to make and how much it costs you to sell. A paid app can be a really great way to start out and make yourself a little bit of money if you've got the right clout, if you can basically reach the right people. But remember, just keep everything tight, keep those budgets really reined in, and make sure that you're releasing fairly regularly to keep that level of interest up. And that's it for this tutorial. We're going to be exploring more in this monetization series in future videos, but for now, I'll see you later.